Hey guys, we're about to start. Trinity students, parents, alumni, and guests, hello and welcome to this event brought to you by Tigers for Liberty, soon to be Young Americans for Freedom at Trinity University. Before we begin to int introducing our guests, I'd like to express our gratitude to all of those who helped make this lecture possible. Most notably, we'd like to thank the Young Americas Foundation and Trinity Student Government Association for providing the necessary funds for this event. We would also like to thank our advisor, Dr. Crockett, and all the student involvement staff, especially Esther Kim and um, for helping us with our planning. Um, finally, a special thanks to Marian Stanko for all of the help she provided in promoting the lecture, and to um, Dean Tuttle for his stance on free speech and supporting free speech on a college campus in today's um, current collegiate environment. Uh, thank you all for your support. My name is Jonah Wint, and I'm a political science major graduating in the spring of 2018. My roles inside of TFL include field director and chief financial officer. TFL was founded by my brother and I in February of 2016. With a little bit of help from Luke Ayers, we've gone from two kids in a dorm room to a club of over 125 ch um, kids. <laughs> to just real quickly lay the ground rules for tonight, if there's a minor disturbance, there is not going to be an action. You do it again, we'll throw you out. Um, <laughs> If there is a continuous disruption, Dinesh will be escorted from the stage and we will not continue until everyone settles down. Um, Q&A will be moderated by my brother Manfred. He will hold the mic. Please keep questions to one or two, sen one or two sentence in sentences that end with a question mark and um, don't make a statement. Our guest tonight is a conservative intellectual giant, author and filmmaker Dinesh D'Souza. Mr. D'Souza was born and raised in Mumbai, India before coming to the United States in 1978. He was educated in Dartmouth College, Dr. Crockett taught me how to correctly pronounce that, where he graduated with a bachelor's degree in English. Later he became a John M. Allen Fellow at the American Enterprise Institute and the Robert and Karen Rishwan Fellow at the Hoover Institute at Stanford University. Throughout his career, Mr. D'Souza has been a strong act, um, advocate for conservative and Christian principles. In the late 1980s, he served as a policy analyst in the Reagan White House before becoming a U.S. citizen in 1991. Mr. Mr. D'Souza was one of the leading defenders of Christianity during the rise of the New Atheism movement. He publicly debated some of those prominent intellectuals at the time, including the late Christopher Hitchens, who called Dinesh D'Souza one of the most articulate opponents. Dinesh D'Souza is the author of numerous books, including The End of Racism, What's So Great About America, My Personal Favorite, Letters to Young Conservative, and many more. His most recent book projects focus on, president, on former President Barack Obama and former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, both of which were adopted in documentary films. D'Souza's 2016 film, Hillary's America, was the highest grossing documentary of the year. Alongside his books and movies, D'Souza's articles and essays have appeared in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, The Atlanta Monthly, Vanity Fair, New Republic, Forbes, and many other publications. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dinesh D'Souza. Wow. Thank you very much. Man, this is a uh, this is quite a crowd. Who caused this to happen? Don't tell me it's the guys who defaced my posters. Oh boy. Well, um, I want to make sure we, um, we have plenty of time for questions. Uh, and so in my opening remarks, I'm going to um, try to adopt the motto that King Henry VIII used with one of his wives. He said, I won't keep you too long. <laughs> um, I'm... Uh, I'm going to talk about um, the significance of Trump 
Uh, and I'm also going to talk about the Democratic Party <laughs> in that order. Now, um, we're living at a very extraordinary time in, in history. It's, it's a little difficult to see that because we're in it. And so we have to sort of step back for a moment, take a little bit of perspective uh, to recognize the significance of what's going on. Uh, American politics historically uh, has been a, a one-party system. And what I mean by that is that we've had typically in American history one dominant party and another party that's kind of an echo. It's running alongside. It's the, the feeble opposition, if you will. Uh, from the time the party system was started in 1828, the Democratic Party was initially the majority party. 1828, Andrew Jackson, to 1860. And then, after the Civil War, 1865, until 1932, the Republican Party became the dominant party. And by dominant here, I mean it dominated generally both houses of Congress, it had the presidency, and had the court. And then from 1932 to 1980, once again, the Democratic Party became the majority party. This is not to say that you wouldn't have any Republican presidents in that time, but the Republican presidents were carried by the Democratic tide. Think of Eisenhower. Eisenhower, even if he wanted to, could never have undone the New Deal. He was operating, if you will, in a Democratic moment. Nixon, the same thing. But since 1980, until now, American politics anomalously uh, has been a kind of a draw. And by that I mean one party has the presidency, the other party has the Congress, and the court teeters precariously in the middle. In the 80s, as you know, Reagan was the president for the most part, the Democrats had the Congress. In the 90s, Clinton was the president, the Republicans got the Congress in 1994. Obama was the president, mostly he's been dealing with a Republican Congress. And now, suddenly, everything came up for grabs. And by that I mean the Congress, the presidency, and by implication, the court. Everyone expected Hillary to win. I did too. And I have to say that even though it's now been, what, three months since the election, the complete shock and uh, elation, and for me, relief, of November 8th has not yet subsided. <laughs> and for the other side, the shock and dismay and sheer disbelief has not subsided either. I'm... I'm sort of reminded of the opening scene in Paradise Lost in which the rebel angels, having mounted an unsuccessful campaign against God, are in Milton's words, hurled headlong flaming from the ethereal sky down into the pandemonium of hell where, completely confounded and amazed, they keep bumping into each other in sullen rebellion against the Almighty. And that, in a nutshell right now, is the Democratic Party. <clears throat> and so what we've seen really since the election is a, um, a convulsion, I think without precedent in American politics. The, the way to think about this is if, if a group of Republicans had, for example, demanded recounts Remember, this is not the year 2000. We're not talking about states that were 300 votes apart. Demanding recounts when Obama won decisively, refused to attend his inauguration, show up en masse and start bashing windows, overturning cars, burning Starbucks, show up en masse at Berkeley in masks with weapons and knock down police barricades, start beating up people, 
Now, this kind of reaction in the aftermath of an election is completely unprecedented. Um, the Democrats have actually not responded this badly to an election since the election of Lincoln. That was the last time they were this upset when they were facing the threat of the Republicans taking away their slaves. <clears throat> They're upset. And they're very upset because, admittedly, the Republicans, kind of out of nowhere, have conjured this extremely unusual creature named Trump <laughs> and made him the Republican nominee over the objections, I have to say, of many Republicans. This actually makes Trump's victory all the more stunning. Hillary had the money, she had the organization, she had the media. I mean, I still sort of am haunted by the daily images of Stephanopoulos <laughs> and all these journalists, I mean, huffing and puffing to drag that crooked hag across the finish line. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> And then on top of that, you have a civil war in the Republican Party. And so Trump's victory becomes almost, you might say, surreal. Surreal. Now, since the Trump election, there is an effort. There's been a kind of a shift of paradigms. A shift of what I'm going to call meta-stories. Now, when we think of the media, we think the media writes stories, and uh, we're often trying to catch um, somebody out in a lie. You know, um, Hillary lied about Benghazi. Uh, Obama lied about this, about you can keep your doctor if you want to. But these are mini lies. You can call them retail lies. A wholesale lie, or what I call a meta lie, is the big lie behind the small lies. And meta lies are very hard to detect because they're so big. They encompass a lot. And I actually want to talk about two meta lies that are made specifically about Trump, but more broadly about the Republican Party. And they pertain a lot, too, to what goes on in higher education because they, they're right in the vocabulary of higher education. And specifically, the two meta stories, the two meta lies, are that Trump is a fascist and that Trump is a racist. And I want to say a little word about both these things. First of all, the idea that Trump is a fascist is now the dominant narrative in describing this president. Trump is a fascist. It's almost taken for granted that a point has been proven. Uh, Robert Paxton, one of the leading uh, scholars of uh, fascism, was interviewed recently in Slate magazine, and he makes the point, he says, when Trump crosses his arms and looks to the left, he goes, he, he bears a resemblance to Mussolini. Oh. I guess he failed to mention that Trump is also a aficionado of Italian food. <laughs> but this notion that Trump is a fascist is actually very important to the left right now because it licenses this orgy of delegitimation hatred, and even violence that is unleashed against Trump and is justified in the name of fighting fascism. There was a, a scholar in the 1960s, a kind of guru of the new left, his name was Herbert Marcuse, and his phrase, his slogan was, no free speech for fascists. No free speech for fascists. And the basic idea was something like this, we, the left, are extremely tolerant. However, we have no obligation to be tolerant of the intolerant. 
Therefore, we are perfectly justified in unleashing by any means necessary, by the way, the name of one of the protest groups at Berkeley, blocking as best as we can, repressing even if we have to free speech. Why? Because how else could you stop Hitler? If Hitler were coming to power in the 30s, wouldn't it be justified to use repression and even violence to shut him down? Look at all the carnage that could have been prevented. So Marcuse's argument was, this was in a famous essay he wrote called Repressive Tolerance, <laughs> that tolerant people have got to learn to be intolerant. And I guess this was sort of the motive of some of the guys who defaced my posters. No free speech for fascists. Now, <clears throat> leave aside the irony which you could see, by the way, if you saw those protests at Berkeley of stormtrooper-like leftists dressed in all black, head to toe with masks, carrying weapons. So leave aside the irony of using fascist tactics to fight fascism. <laughs> I actually want to raise the prior question, which is, is it really the case that Trump is a fascist? Is the GOP a fascist party? <clears throat> First of all, it's important to know that this whole business of Trump and the GOP being fascist relies upon a, an assumption that is never questioned, <clears throat> that fascism is something that is right-wing. Fascism is a right-wing phenomenon. And if you think about it, most of us haven't thought about why fascism is right-wing. What does it even mean to be right-wing, and what is it about fascism that makes it right-wing? Well, the fascists were really ultra-nationalists. First of all, being ultra-nationalist hardly makes you right-wing. Che Guevara was an ultra-nationalist. Stalin was an ultra-nationalist. In fact, he talked about motherland Russia and what he called socialism in one country. Gandhi was a nationalist. FDR was a nationalist. Hugo Chavez in Venezuela is a nationalist. So clearly it can't be that nationalism alone, a fierce attachment to one's own country, automatically makes you a fascist. Well, Trump is um, against immigrants. I'm an immigrant. My wife here, Debbie, is an immigrant from Venezuela. You might think that we've been living in fear since Trump's election. <laughs> when you open the New York Times every day, I see headlines like, Trump getting ready to deport millions of immigrants. Millions of immigrants. Not illegal aliens, but immigrants. Notice that somehow suddenly, illegal aliens are conflated with immigrants. I don't even mean illegal immigrants. If you're illegal, you're not an immigrant. People say, well, Trump is getting ready. <laughs> Trump is getting ready to deny the illegals their constitutional rights. <laughs> yes, this is actually the implication of the argument. Now, it is not an argument from fascism. It is an argument right out of Locke and John Stuart Mill and the most liberal of liberal traditions to believe that American society is a social compact. It's a bargain or a deal among a group of people who come together, form a government, agree to relinquish the exercise of certain of their basic rights in exchange for certain forms of protection. This social compact is between and among citizens in the same way that the rules of a club apply to its members. If someone is outside the social compact, they do not have 
any constitutional rights. None. None. Now, I'm not suggesting <clears throat> that they don't have natural rights, nor am I suggesting that they don't have human rights. But constitutional rights are the result of a civil bargain among citizens. And like I say, this is the core of the meaning of liberalism. Well, yeah, but it's vaguely reminiscent of all the stuff that Hitler used to do. Now, first of all, we live in a society where the term Hitler has taken on a certain kind of bizarre significance. The philosopher Leo Strauss used to talk about what he called reductio ad Hitlerum. <laughs> Basically, if Hitler was for it, that makes it bad. But the point I want to make, in California, for example, this whole notion of Hitler, the Nazis, is preposterously used to refer to things that have nothing to do with Nazism. You literally have people with great excitement say, I'm a food Nazi. I'm a surf Nazi. I'm a health Nazi. For them, Nazism basically denotes commitment. Being really dedicated to something makes you a Nazi. Now, here's what I want to say. Hitler was not anti-immigrant. The Jews in Germany were citizens. They weren't immigrants. They were citizens of Germany. So clearly Hitler's distinction was not between the immigrant and the native. Hitler's distinction was within Germany. It was a kind of ethnic or racial distinction in which some citizens belonged, the Nordics, the Germanics, and other citizens were excluded. Hitler preferred Austrian Germans over German Jews. So right away, the, this, this whole immigrant thing has nothing to do with Hitler. He was operating on a totally different compass. Now, <clears throat> I'm writing about this, and I'm going to be having a lot more to say about it. I'll make one more brief observation about fascism, and then I want to move to racism, which is going to be a little bit more my focus. <clears throat> fascism, by the way, is um, not the same as Nazism. Uh, Hitler very rarely used the term fascist. Read Mein Kampf. You, you'll hardly find that term ever used. Mussolini, who was the prototypical fascist, never called himself a National Socialist. And so fascism and National Socialism are somewhat different. They're related. Essentially, the main difference is that National Socialism was, at its core, racist. National Socialism was anti-Semitic. National Socialism drew a racial line that fascism never drew. For example, the Italian fascists were a lot less racist than, for example, the American Democratic Party. <clears throat> Much less. I, I don't deny Mussolini did become uh, anti-Semitic toward the end, but it was mainly because he felt he had to maintain the alliance with Hitler. There was no inherent anti-Semitism in fascism. In fact, a number of the early fascists were Jews. Now, when you look at the origin of fascism, a subject that is now shrouded in mist, you come to a remarkable finding. And that is that all, all the founders of original fascism were leftists. All of them were either Marxists or socialists or radicals associated in Britain with the Labour Party in France with the Socialist Party, in Germany and Italy with either the Marxists or the Communists. In other words, fascism was start to finish a left-wing phenomenon that emerged out of a debate about the failed prophecies of Marx. Essentially, Marx predicted the revolution of the proletariat. It never happened. And so there was something called the crisis of Marxism in the early part of the 20th century. 
And out of that crisis of Marxism came two new variations of Marxism, very different from anything Marx would have predicted. The first was Leninist Bolshevism, and the other was Italian fascism. This is the undisputed truth of history, but if you're a little puzzled about it, I don't really blame you. Why? Because after World War II, there was a very important progressive cover-up project that went on in America. And the basic idea was to camouflage the close associations of the political left with fascism and Nazism. And to move fascism and Nazism from the left, where they were always understood to be, into the right-wing column. This was actually one of the most cunning sleights of hand ever performed in American history. Now, how do you pull something like this off? How do you fool most of the people most of the time? You can only do it if your group, the left, is sufficiently dominant in academia, in media, and in Hollywood. If you have that, you have the three biggest megaphones of our culture. And so you can broadcast all kinds of whoppers and lies, all kinds of fake news and fake history. And even if some guy in the audience knows differently, you know differently, but you don't have a big enough megaphone to contradict this orthodoxy. And this is kind of why there is a mentality on the left that tries to keep people like me from speaking on campus. Not, not because, <clears throat> not because I'm coming here to blast out racial epithets. You know, I don't need the pompous, all oh, defenders to the death is right to speak. It's not about that. It is that ultimately the ideas that I put forward can't be refuted by these people. They don't know enough. And so, and so, so they become very bitter and frightened, inwardly frightened, because I'll say things, I'll present facts, and they're facts of a scientific nature, by which I mean simply that they are open to refutation. Open to refutation. I'll give you an example of what I mean, and in the process, I'm going to pivot a little bit from fascism to racism. Uh, in the movie Hillary's America, <laughs> I make an observation, almost offhandedly, that in 1860, the year of the Civil War, no Republican owned a slave. All the slaves, by the way, we are talking about four million slaves. All the slaves in the United States were owned by Democrats. Now, as I say, this is a very refutable claim. All you have to do is give me a list of 10 Republicans who own slaves. I would have to take it back. The left has been thrashing around in academia and the media for now nine months to find a single refutation to the point I have just made. Someone, this is the, my most intelligent interlocutor, pointed out to me that Ulysses H. Grant inherited a slave on his wife's side. One slave. I responded that that was true, but it happened at a time when Ulysses H. Grant was a Democrat. <laughs> now, the people who are saying that Trump is a racist. Trump is a racist based on what? Well, you know, he, uh, <coughs> he referred to a federal judge as a Mexican. <laughs> well, all right, the guy was a US citizen. He is a US citizen. I'm a US citizen. That's kind of like calling me an Indian. Okay, at the worst, it's a bit insensitive. But insensitivity 
is a long way from bigotry. Let's look at the people who are actually pointing the finger at Trump. The Democrats. This is the party that was the vigorous and in, indeed politically the sole defender of slavery in the United States. All over the world, slavery has been defended as a regrettable necessity. Aristotle says that there's dirty work to be done and that's why we have slaves to do it. Never in the history of the world has any political group or party actually argued that slavery is good not only for the master, but good for the slave. Good for the slave. This is the so-called positive good, of, good school of slavery. Advanced, invented, and promulgated by the Democratic Party. Now, you might say, wait a minute. That really wasn't the Democrats. John C. Calhoun may have been a Democrat, but he was a Southerner. This is really a debate between the North and the South. No, not so. The Northern Democratic Party protected slavery with the same cunning and relentless ingenuity as the Southern Democratic Party. Most Southerners did not own slaves. Most Confederates did not own slaves. The secession debate, it is true, was a North-South debate, but the slavery debate, no. It was exclusively between the anti-slavery Republican Party and the pro-slavery Democratic Party, North and South. This is a fact. Now, again, after the war, the Democrats said, <laughs> this is very embarrassing, let's blame the South. And this is in fact part of the way that you promulgate the big lie, the big wholesale lie. And that is, when you make the lie, you say, it wasn't me. It was the white man who did it. It was the South who did it. It was, it was, the, um, it was America who did it. Notice how often people say, America did this and America did that. Wait a minute, if America did it, it would still be going on. Obviously, some Americans did it, and other Americans stopped them. The truth is that the worst bigotry of American history, from slavery to segregation to Jim Crow to the Ku Klux Klan to lynching, forced sterilization, this is the actual record of the Democratic Party. Yes. <laughs> So prove me wrong. I assert that every segregation law in the South, without exception, was passed by a Democratic legislature and signed by a Democratic governor and enforced by Democratic sheriffs and Democratic officials. I assert that <coughs> the Ku Klux Klan, when it had power, was the domestic terrorist arm of the Democratic Party. I don't mean that Klansmen just happened to be Democrats. I mean the Klan was used that way by the Democratic Party. If you made a list of all the Grand Dragons and Grand Klegals of the Ku Klux Klan over 100 years, 95% of them would be Democrats. Even if you go to the Civil Rights Movement of the 1960s, <coughs> more Republicans proportionately voted for the Civil Rights Act of 1964 the Voting Rights Act of 1965, the Fair Housing Bill of 1968, than Democrats did. The opposition to the civil rights laws came from the Democratic Party. If the Democrats had been the only party in Congress, no Republicans, none of those laws would have passed. Now, I realize I'm running a little short of time. And, um, and I want to kind of get to the fun part, which is the part in which we actually get to have a discussion and test out these ideas that I've been so cavalierly lobbying, these sort of Trumpian bombshells that I've been not tweeting but sort of blurting uh, out here tonight. Because think about it. If what I say is true, 
then a lot of what you've been taught about all this is pure bunk. So I could be right, or you could be right. And that's why we're here, to find out who's right in the spirit of real debate and real dialogue. Uh, as I said, I'm an immigrant, and I believe in American exceptionalism. <clears throat> When I was a student at Dartmouth, my professors told me, you can't say things like that because they imply the superiority of American culture. Don't you know that all cultures are inherently equal? No culture is better or worse, superior or inferior to any other? And I thought to myself, if that were true, you'd never have any immigrants. Because <clears throat> we all, we all have a natural attachment to our own family, our own community, our own neighborhood, our own country. Why on earth would you take the trouble and the risk and the fear to pick up and leave and go to another country if you didn't think that on the balance, that other country was better than the one you're coming from. That's the whole point of emigrating. To me, Trump represents in America ladders of opportunity. Ladders of opportunity. And that's what the Republican Party represents. The basic idea is that, and by the way, it's not that government has nothing to do. Government has a job. Hold the ladder. But we have a job, which is to climb. And how high you get on the ladder, I admit some of it depends on luck, but also a lot of it depends on your own creativity and industry and effort. Now, there is a rival approach to moving up in America, and that needs, in fairness, to be mentioned. I call it the politics of the rope. And the basic idea is that you have a tall building, and all of us are down here, and the Democrats from the top are going to let down a rope. <laughs> Their idea is that if you hang on to the rope, they'll pull you up. Now, as an immigrant, I have to say that on the first glance, the rope is more attractive than the ladder. Why? Because the ladder involves work. You have to actually climb. The rope merely involves hanging on. So it's kind of more appealing. I can move up while doing nothing. But it then occurs to me that I'm at the mercy of the guy holding the rope. If he lets me go, down I go. Um, and then I look around America at all these people of the rope in all our inner cities. I don't just mean blacks. I'm talking about the barrios of America, the native reservations for American Indians. And I see that all these people are all going for the rope, a lot of them, and they're being pulled up. But once they get pulled up a little bit, the people at the top of the building seem to hold. Why? to keep them dangling precariously in the air. They're too high off the ground to be able to drop down, and yet no one's pulling them up. Why? Because it seems like the interest of the people at the top is not to have these people be independent, but have them be dependent voters. Voters. So, faced with the choice of the ladder and the rope, uh, I, for one, go for the ladder. And I think most immigrants would go for the ladder. And that's Trump's bargain. Trump's bargain is America is a great club. We want people who want to be members. And we want to make sure that the people who are outside the club, who are trying to get in, 
don't wish any harm to the people who are in the club. Again, <laughs> that's not a fascist idea, it's kind of a liberal idea. If you go right back to Locke, the primary reason for having a government at all is to protect us from foreign and domestic thugs. That is the first job of the government. I'm not saying it's the only job, but if the government isn't doing that one, I'd rather not do anything else. Let's do that one first, and then we'll talk about the National Endowment for the Arts. So Trump's, Trump is giving a lot of people a new and previously undiagnosed ailment that I'm diagnosing for the first time tonight. It's called Trump Derangement Syndrome. It is the derangement caused in people by the mere mention of the word Trump. <laughs> of the word Trump. <clears throat> Look, in a little bit of time, this will all settle out. The left is very frightened of Trump. This is the most energetic, ferocious, fearless guy I have seen in American politics, including Reagan. <clears throat> um, this is a guy who is taking on the Democrats and taking on some Republicans and at the same time taking on the media and finding time in the process to swat Meryl Streep right over here and Saturday Night Live over there. He's fighting the culture war in the middle of a political war. And most remarkably, he's winning. He's winning. <clears throat> Debbie and I were married. We're coming up on our first year anniversary by Rafael Cruz, who's Ted Cruz's dad. You'll get a feeling of... Um, <clears throat> where we're coming from. But I have to say that having observed Trump now very closely through the election process and since he's been elected, um, he's truly sui generi. He's unique. No other Republican could pull off what he's pulling off right now. How it will end, I don't know. But I do know that in the 80s, when Reagan spoke about mourning in America, he spoke of a mood of optimism, of possibility, of excitement. Excitement about being alive today and excitement about living in America. And I recognize that after quite some time and some rather interesting adventures with the Obama administration, I now again feel that sense of excitement and possibility and so it remains to be seen, but if I had to bet, I would bet that Trump will in fact deliver what we haven't seen in a whole generation, which is mourning in America. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for that very nice Texas round of applause for Dinesh D'Souza. Hello, my name is Manfred Wendt. I'll be handling the mic for questions and answers before we get to that. Thank you everyone for respectfully listening. He doesn't get that often. <laughs> so a quick couple of rules for Q&A. From an orderly line over there, I will be holding the mic. I will be holding the mic. <laughs> please line up on the right side, and then when you go up, please go up the opposite side of the same staircase. Please remember one question per person. You may keep standing next to me while he's answering your question, and then after that, you may return to your seat. 
Thank you, and we're on a limited time, so no promises that you'll be able to ask your question, but I hope you do. Thank you. Dinesh, thank you very much. Probably, hold on. Go ahead. Probably on behalf of everybody here, we want to thank you for being a great American and thank you for all the wonderful things you've done and given us all this good ammunition to fight the wrong side. Thank you very much. What are your plans? What are your future plans of other movies or other things, projects that you're doing to give us, again, more amazing ammunition to teach us the truth and help us to deliver this message? Question is, what am I doing now? I'm uh, writing a book about, um, about fascism and American politics, which will come out this summer. Um, on the movie front, I'm actually going to pivot and start doing some feature films. Uh, the reason is that the uh, Hollywood, if you think about it, puts out its message, not just through documentary films, but through romantic comedies, thrillers, horror films, animated family movies. Um, and uh, the big guy in Hollywood is not uh, Michael Moore. It's, uh, well, the big guy in Hollywood is Michael Moore. <laughs> but um, the important guy in Hollywood is certainly Steven Spielberg. And so uh, having established a kind of a toehold in Hollywood, uh, I'm going to try to m move from uh, doing documentary films to doing some feature films, and we'll see how that goes. Okay. Hi, Mr. D'Souza. I'm a student here at Trinity University, and I had a lot of questions for you, but I settled on this one. Uh, in s some of your previous writings, you indicated that the reasons why America is, or why the West, rather, is great is because of science, technology, and capitalism. My question is, how can you say that Trump makes America great when he's anti-science, denies global warming, uh, anti-capitalism, he is protectionist, and does not believe uh, in things such as the TPP and free trade deals and has shown a flagrant disregard for democratic institutions through executive overreach. <coughs> the question is, if, uh, if the West is uh, defined by science, democracy, and capitalism, uh, how come Trump is against all three? Um, I don't want to get into global warming because it's um, it's it's too big of a hole for me to get in right now. Um, I want to focus on trade because that's more central to Trump's agenda anyway. Um, look, it remains to be seen, but in my opinion, Trump is not, in fact, a protectionist. Now, what I mean by this is that um, we don't live in a free trade world. If the United States tried to sell cars in Japan or China today, the Japanese and the Chinese will slap big tariffs on those cars. Now, there's a certain um, invertebrate, in effeminate free trade movement in America that basically says, that's okay. Let them do it. Let's have free trade over here. So even if they put tariffs on our cars, we shouldn't put tariffs on their cars. I think Trump regards this position as somewhat unmanly. <laughs> and, and I think he's right. I think, I think what Trump is trying to say is, listen guys, here's the deal. If you want to put tariffs on our cars, we're going to be slapping tariffs on your cars. But the point of doing the tariffs is not because we like tariffs, it's because we don't like what you're doing to the auto industry over there. You take your tariffs down, we'll be happy to take ours down. We're, what we want is real free trade, which is to say a level playing field. Now tell me what about that is protectionist? Nothing at all. Okay. <clears throat> Hello, Mr. Tasusa. Thank you for taking the time to be here. Um, my question for you is, um, with all the complaints that people do about Trump, whether it be through the media, or the, all those riots in Berkeley, uh, do you think uh, all the complaining about Trump is pretty much guaranteeing him a second term when he's not even a year into his presidency? Well, 
The question is about Trump's future and you know, I think that the answer depends on what Trump delivers. What he delivers. If Trump delivers a million new jobs, you know, we've had a stagnant economy for eight years. We have a $19 trillion deficit, right? The deficit more than doubled under, not the deficit, the national debt more than doubled under Obama. He inherited eight and a half trillion, we now have 19 trillion. Think about that. We don't even have a way to pay it off unless our economy starts growing at four or 5% again. So if Trump can do that, there's no point even running against him in four years. Uh, my question pertains to your argument about racism and the Democratic Party historically. Could you provide context within the last 10 years for racist policies enacted by Democrats if it's true that their historical behavior influences what they do now? And I'd appreciate it if you could speak specifically to repealing provisions of the Voting Rights Act in red states like North Carolina. <laughs> the question is about um, um, racism today and these arguments about voter ID laws in North Carolina. It is true, historically, that a lot of voting rules, from literacy tests to poll taxes, uh, to even, you may say, uh, extreme demands uh, that you produce various types of credentialing, were used by Democrats to prevent blacks from voting. And this was done for 75 years. The same people who did that now pretend to be inflamed about much less onerous, simple ID laws that basically say nothing more than something like produce a driver's license if you're going to vote. Now, I don't deny the historical echo, but the historical echo loses its validity when the voter ID laws are not being pressed by the same people. The question, the deeper part of the question is, so prove to me that the Democratic Party is racist now. And um, as often happens with a tough question, this is kind of when I rise to the occasion. Um, um, well, let me just say this. If one goes today to the Democratic-controlled inner city, and we're talking here about some two dozen cities entirely dominated by the Democratic Party, there's not a Republican in sight. I argue that we will see in them now all the five features of the slave plantation that Kenneth Stamp outlined in his classic work, The Peculiar Institution. In a description of the plantation, Kenneth Stamp identifies five things that you would see on a slave plantation. Number one, broken down, dilapidated, and unsafe housing. Number two, broken families. You can see this under slavery. There was a confusion of who's the real father. Mulattoes running around in the plantation, the family structure and decay. Number three, a high degree of violence required to hold the place together. Police power, whippings, overseers, fences, barbed wire. <clears throat> Number four, everybody gets a basic provision. If you need food, you have health care, they call the doctor, but nobody gets ahead. There's no opportunity. Nobody really advances. The Southerners and the Democrats used to call slavery a school of civilization. And Stamp goes, that's not a school from which anyone ever seemed to graduate. And finally, nihilism and despair. A feeling that there's no future, that this is an intergenerational, ongoing, lasting way of life. Now, all those five features can be traced directly to inner city Oakland, inner city Baltimore, many places, Chicago. And like I say, this has been going on since the 60s. The United States has spent trillions of dollars 
to fix these places. The Democrats have been in charge of fixing it. And yet, many of these places are no better off than they were in 1967. Think about that. <laughs> so, at the very least, this reflects a callous and shocking disdain for the welfare of the people who live in those communities. And for me, this is a big opportunity for Trump. If Trump is able to talk straight to people in our inner cities, and I would add in our barrios and on our native reservations, and show them that there's a way to get up and get off the plantation, this would be a mammoth opportunity for the Republican Party. First of all, first of all, thank you for coming here. Uh, I'm Travis, I'm a student here, and I wanna I'll ask a little bit deeper on what the previous questioner asked. So, in your introduction, you talked about the many party systems that go on as the parties change over time. Why did the actions of the Democratic Party three or four party systems ago, 170 years ago, define the Democratic Party today with different people in it and a different ideology espoused? The question is, why blame the Democrats today for what people did 100 years ago, under 150 years ago under slavery, uh, 90 years ago under segregation, uh, 60 years ago under the Ku Klux Klan, uh, 50 years ago under lynching, of, uh, 45 years ago in voting against the Civil Rights Acts. Um, you know, why, why blame the Democrats for all that? They're, they're changed. Now, no, no. Quite honestly, it is true that people can change. Whitaker Chambers used to be a communist, and he defected. He left communism. But Whitaker Chambers also wrote a book, five or six hundred pages long, called Witness, in which he gave a wrenching moral accounting of how this change of heart came about. Now, if Robert Byrd has written such a book, about how he outgrew his longtime association with the Ku Klux Klan, uh, I have yet to read it. The truth of it is that Robert Byrd was called the conscience of the Senate until he died in the year 2000. Now, we're not talking about 50 years ago. We're talking about six years ago. When Byrd died, Hillary Clinton called him her mentor. Uh, Bill Clinton and Obama both went to the funeral. And Bill Clinton said something very interesting at the funeral. He said, don't be too hard on old Bird for being in the Klan. He goes, you had to be in the Klan in order to advance in the Democratic Party. <laughs> Think about that. You had to be in the Klan. Now, here's my point, and I'll, I'll, I'll be brief on this. The Democratic Party has never, ever admitted its history. They have never taken responsibility they have never apologized for it. They have never paid one penny in restitution for it. So the very least we should ask of this party of bigotry is that if it wants to claim that it's cleaned up its act and is doing something new, is that they go before the descendants of the people that they killed and mutilated and enslaved and abused, spell out exactly what it is they did, why it is they believe differently. In other words, first produce a moral accounting and an apology, and then we'll see. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Um, in your book, Stealing America, you comment on how the Patriot Act went from the federal government spying on suspected terrorists to the federal government dis um, spying on all Americans, and you seem to consider this an abuse of power. Does this compare to Trump's travel ban, where instead of detaining and denying entrance to, uh, to suspected terrorists, um, to detaining and denying entrance to everyone from a specified country? I guess your question is, um, hey, Dinesh, you're against spying on all Americans. You're against, you know, reading their texts and recording their phones. Um, and watching what they see on TV, and, um, and monitoring their, their web traffic. 
And isn't that inconsistent? Because Trump, with a similar broad brush, is saying from these six countries, travel-wise, we're not going to take anybody. Now, I don't think the analogy holds at all for a couple of reasons. Number one, American citizens are American citizens. And so the rights of the Constitution, unreasonable search and seizure, privacy. What does it mean to say we have a right to privacy if somebody says, Dinesh, uh, we're going to be tapping your phone, reading your email, looking at your texts, and monitoring your web traffic, but you do have the right to abort your kid. <laughs> what kind of privacy right is that? That makes no sense. Now, what Trump is saying is that there are countries and there are even communities of refugees that are extremely difficult to vet. This is one of the disadvantages of being a refugee, is that you're displaced, you're uprooted, you don't have a community, you don't have references, and so you become a little bit hard to check out. And so I take Trump to be saying, listen, we have a humanitarian desire to help refugees, but it is necessarily subordinate to the primary duty of every country to protect its own citizens. <laughs> okay. um, hi, Dinesh. Uh, I, I just want to thank you first off for, for coming. It's, it's, a, it's an honor just to be able to ask you a simple question. Um, my name is Joey Reyes. I'm a native San Antonian here. And um, the, 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 the barrios and the ghettos that you talked about, um, those, are, those are the homes that I grew up in. Those are the environments I grew up in. And my question to you is, um, having friends, having family members that, that really, they, they, they firmly believe that the Democratic Party is a Democratic Party that, that wants to help them, wants to give them a foot up, how do you, how do you get to their understanding and, and get to their level of, of really showing them and, and, and actually... Um, giving the evidence, the proper evidence, to prove otherwise. <clears throat> the, um, the Republican Party is um, in a difficult position because when it comes to the barrio, um, I speak very limited Spanish, but my wife is fluent. She watches Telemundo, and Univision, and she says that they are to the far left of MSNBC. They're so left-wing that they are providing a ceaseless drumbeat of propaganda, and no one is there to counter it. There's, not, there's no Fox News uh, to provide even the modicum of balance. So if I were you know, uh, a Republican mover and shaker, I would start thinking about ways to communicate with the Spanish community and do outreach that really reaches people and offers an alternative point of view. Kind of like I represent coming here at Trinity, an alternative point of view. Um, and we need that in the, in the barrio. And initially, there might be some guys who come and you know, deface the Republican posters and all, uh, but the message will eventually get through. Okay? One more question. <laughs> Well, if you don't mind, let's just keep going just because it's a long line. I'm sorry. All right, let's do it after. <laughs> Hello, Mr. D'Souza. I'm an op-ed writer for the school paper. And to full disclosure, I wrote an article saying that I think you're a hack. <laughs> now, I came with an open mind. And I was disappointed to find that much like much of the current president's comments, yours are based on sort of shallow logic, uh, lack of expertise, no real facts, and economic <coughs> ignorance. But, and some conservatives have said that too, but I have a question about the broader conservative philosophy, and this gets back to what you said about trade. Now you said that, you know, we gotta, you know, get trade back in order, but with the trend in technology nowadays, the real threat is not trade and loss of jobs overseas, but automation, artificial intelligence, the replacement of many of the jobs that serve as a starting level for economic advancement. What role does conservatism have in a world in which machines and automation can take the place of much of human labor and activity that generates income and value for everyday people? All right, well, man. 
Um, let me say this. If it is the case that in what I said tonight, and I, I put some fairly incendiary material on the table, if I had said something that was even arguably wrong, factually wrong, about the Democratic Party or about fascism or about Trump, it would be very easy for someone to point it out. So normally, if you're going to call someone a hack, you should kind of try to establish your own bona fides. Uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> Look, um, a certain amount of moral indignation is the staple of being a late teen. And so, <laughs> I think we should be indulgent. Um, now, technology. Look, here's the point. We have seen in the United States the ordinary working guy I don't just mean the white guy, the black guy, the Hispanic guy. The working class in this country has been hit by three powerful winds blowing in the same direction. And those winds are named globalization, immigration, and technology. Um, now, what does the Democratic Party plan to do about any of these? And the answer is nothing, nothing. Obama did nothing, Hillary proposed to do nothing. In fact, what the Democratic Party wants to do is to increase the problem of illegal immigration motivated solely by getting Democratic voters with complete indifference to the impact on the worker. Now, Trump, has never spoken one word against technology. The technology boom in the United States is the product of Reagan-era policies of privatization, deregulation, the unleashing of the entrepreneur. If you don't believe me, you know, when I came to the United States, the entrepreneur was in a funk. The guy who was riding high on the hog was the, the federal worker. Why? Because a generation ago, a moronic John F. Kennedy said, if you're young, if you're idealistic, do what? Join the Peace Corps. Become a public servant. An oxymoron if I ever heard one. Um, and so the bureaucrat was made the embodiment of American idealism. Reagan challenged that. Reagan goes, it's not the bureaucrat. The bureaucrat just sits at his desk. Reagan told the story of a guy at the Bureau of Indian Affairs who was sobbing at his desk. And a man came up to him and said, what's up? He goes, my Indian died. And this was the, this was the Reaganite celebration of the entrepreneur. And if you talk to young entrepreneurs, Michael Dell and others, they will tell you that the Reaganite mood of optimism is what launched Microsoft in 1982 and Dell in the 80s and this whole technology boom. So, in short, Trump recognizes the great benefit of technology. But he also realizes that in a society, it's not fair for a whole bunch of people to gallop tremendously ahead while a whole bunch of hardworking people are left behind. What kind of American dream is it that only works for some people? If we're going to have ladders of opportunity, everybody should be able to see a ladder. <clears throat> This, this is the new republicanism that Trump represents. Ordinary Republicans don't even think about working people. They don't even talk like this. Um, they sound, they, they, start, they talk about things like trade instead of talking about things like workers and jobs and incomes and looking after your family. So this kind of down-to-earthedness of Trump, I think, is part of the secret of his political success. <clears throat> Uh, so, I support Donald Trump, and I support uh, his immigration ban, uh, but my question is, uh, on this very sensitive topic, uh, what is your educated opinion on the immigration ban? Well, 
my educated opinion on the ban um, is that it's going to be fought out in the court, and uh, the court is precariously balanced. Uh, all policies, I mean, look, people say Trump is a fascist, he's overthrowing the institutions of government. If he was overthrowing the institutions of government, how is it that every outlet and every platform is blasting Trump to kingdom come? Obviously, we have free speech in this country. Everything he does is to go through the court. So our checks and balances are intact. I mean, we have a press that's almost a unified opposition. Look, longer, longer term, longer term, there's a difficult issue of what we do with illegals who are here and have been here a long time. You can't blame them exclusively because a lot of people here in this country did sly and underhanded things to enable that to happen. So there's a lot of blame to go around in how we got here. And I don't entirely know how you fix it. But in order to fix the immigration problem, first of all, you need to credibly convince the American people that you recognize the problem of unlimited illegal immigration. And so it is my view that paradoxically, if Trump deports a few million people, he will be in a much better position to figure out what to do about the rest. <clears throat> Good evening. Um, I, I was just wondering if, uh, okay, because this has been a tame crowd, but say if it was like a Berkeley, right? <clears throat> you have the megaphone where you can actually, you know, argue your point. How should we, the people, respond, react to... Um, the left's vicious, you know, like uh, sh shutting us down, being intolerant of talk. Okay, question is, what can I do? Now look, when I, when I go every day on Twitter, if I put out a tweet, literally within 30 seconds, 10 paid leftists will go on my Twitter and blast the heck out of me. They'll attack my family, they'll attack the way I look, they'll call me a felon. These, got, these are paid dudes who are paid to essentially terrorize conservatives in public life to make people like me go, you know what, who needs it? It's so crazy, life is too short. Um, let me just get out of the public square. Um, now, we don't think like this. When Nancy Pelosi tweets, nobody goes on her Twitter and starts insulting her, her family, um, you know, making fun of the fact that she's a grandmother, ridiculing her looks. I mean, conservatives don't even think like this. I mean, I do. But, <laughs> but, but they don't. Most don't. Um, so, there are two ways. If you want to know how you can be effective, we live in an age of social media. You say, hey, I've got only 100 friends on Facebook. Yeah, but each of them has 100 friends. You're a little publisher. So, today you have real power which if you're able to organize and concentrate can bring about real, real change. So think about ways, either on the positive or on the negative side, that you can use your influence to actually put information out in this age of information. Okay? <clears throat> All right, uh, this is the last question. Last question? Uh, sure. I, I think... Um, uh, let, let's just take a, what, two more and then we'll wrap it up. All right. Uh, as a fellow immigrant, I totally uh, can relate to your immigration. However, my trip was a little bit shorter from Wisconsin to the Republic of Texas. But uh, <laughs> while, I was still in, <laughs> while I was still in Wisconsin, we had to go ahead and suffer recall season after recall season. So I, I can understand where uh, in the talk here, you shared that the theology of liberalism is all about hate, fear, and ignorance, whereas conservatism is more focused on love, respect, and education. So I think you touched on it, uh, how we can go ahead and um, help to go ahead and educate those, help them overcome their fear so that they can start to feel the love and respect for each other so that they can accept the message. Well, what's the best way for us to do that? I think you touched on it with you're going to be uh, creating some movies, and with The Last Gentleman, you said that we can use social media but as far as overcoming that fear portion, I think that's the big wall. How can we go ahead and help break through or help melt that down for them? The question is about, um, about fear. Um, it's important to recognize that fear drives a lot of American politics. Um, 
a lot of conservatives think, you know, gee, why aren't our leaders doing what they were elected to do? What a, what a wimp, you know, John Boehner is. Uh, what a wimp McConnell is. Now, now, the question I ask is, why are they wimps? What introduces the kind of wimp vaccine into these guys? It's not that they want Hillary or Obama to succeed. My answer is that they're terrified by the media. They know that the media has the power to humiliate. And we are living at a time where our media, our press, is not a real press. Now, let me give you a tiny personal example of what I mean. I made a movie last year, Hillary's America. Okay. The number one, the number one, not political, the number one documentary of the year. Uh, the number eight most successful political documentary of all time. And um, it's a movie making contentious claims about the current election at a time of election fever. Now, it is a fact that during the entire election season, if you watched ABC, CBS, NBC, or listened to NPR, this movie was never mentioned. It was a non-existent movie. Now, how can you explain this? The press is covering the news. We are in the fray. Uh, we are making arguments about Hillary. They're relevant to the election. Nothing could be more timely. If I had been Michael Moore, I would have been on The View. I'd be on the Today Show. I'd be everywhere. <clears throat> and yet, they don't argue against the movie. They don't refute it. They simply don't acknowledge its existence. So this is the era where this is what we mean by fake news. It's not that we don't need a free press, an independent press. We have a press that for the past eight years, if they had discovered that Obama had committed five serious felonies, would do everything they could to suppress that information from reaching the public. That's true. <clears throat> when I was thrown in the slammer for my campaign finance violation, innumerable reporters said to me, Dinesh, what's happening to you is absolutely horrible. We can't find a single case in American history where anybody has even been prosecuted, let alone locked up for doing what you did. Not one of them ever said that in public. They knew it was true. They knew it was a political vendetta. But they were so bought into this kind of mad ideology that they could not for fear, for fear, because if you are a liberal and you stray off the reservation, they will destroy your career. It's not just a conservative. So this is the actual atmosphere of fear. Aristotle says that courage is the greatest of all the virtues because it's the virtue that makes the other ones possible. If you're a student on campus, a left-wing campus, and you speak up, you want to say what's true, you need courage. You don't just need truth. That's a virtue. But courage is the greater virtue because it, makes, it has to pave the way for you having the guts to tell the truth. Okay, last question. Hi, name's Chris. First off, on behalf of millennials, I apologize for the other millennials who were here earlier. <laughs> and uh, as to my question, I find that I actually am fortunate as a minority because unlike a white conservatives, I actually get freedom of speech. But uh, my point is, how can I exercise his rights uh, more effectively against the problem minorities in political debates? Look, um, let me say that despite the little poster incident of some time ago, uh, we have actually had a very respectful, cordial, and I think stimulating discussion tonight. <laughs> Uh, 
Um, I, I like speaking on campus. My, my wife gets a little bit nervous sometimes, but I, I like the liberal campus because I find that what's wrong with our, with our young people today is not that they're bad kids. It's not that they lack idealism. It's not that they don't believe in truth. None of that. It's not that they're lazy. It's really that the fact that their elders have abused them have done them wrong. And what I mean by this is that when I was a student in the 80s, um, there were liberals, there were conservatives. I went to a very liberal campus. But there was a conservative point of view that was taught in the classroom, that was argued about on the campus. And today when I go to campuses, it's, that conservatism just does not exist. Young people are, don't reject conservatism. They don't know what it is. If you were to say to most young people, what is it that the conservative is trying to conserve? They would give you a vacant look. Or they would say something like, well, uh, maybe racism? So this is the state of our campuses. Now, even me speaking on campus is a very small antidote. I mean, you know, here I am on Tuesday, I'm gone on Wednesday. But the powers that be on the campus are here every day. Uh, and they're the ones who grade your papers, and they're the ones who determine your future. So my appeal ultimately is not to take on faith what I've said. It's to recognize that there is a whole other way of looking at the world, and this is being debated in the country right now, and if it's not being debated at Trinity, then your own teachers and administrators are doing you a disservice. They are. And, and so, so even if you are a liberal, and I would say especially if you are a liberal, you should push and demand that if conservative viewpoints are not present on the faculty, that the school import them. Not for the sake of the conservatives, but for your sake. So you can actually understand better how people think and what are the policies that are actually going to be determining the future of your country right now? Like it or not, we are living now in Trump's America. <clears throat> I'm not going to say, I'm not going to say deal with it. I'm not going to say get used to it. But I am going to say try to understand it try to reflect upon it. That is the essence of a university, and thank you very much. All right, everyone, thank you for coming. Thank you for that big Texas welcome. And everyone drive home safely, please.